Good evening and thanks for joining us on our program tonight. Our sign language interpreter is William Silla. We have lots lined up for you. The number, lest we forget, and you do not want to miss our editorial on the show tonight. But first, today's top stories. The chairman of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, Chairman Isaac Hassan, remains adamant that he and his fellow commissioners will not go home. Hassan made the remarks as 2013 presidential contenders Paul Muite and Martha Karua joined calls for the IEBC commissioners to resign. This launch of the Kura Yangu Sauti Yangu initiative by a consortium of civil societies in Nairobi would turn out to be the arena where IEBC chairman Isaac Hassan would for a second time in just two weeks remain adamant that neither he nor the eight IEBC commissioners will resign just yet. A stance that seemingly agitated 2013 presidential contenders Paul Muite and Mother Karua who also wants the Hassan-led team to go home. This thing has become a, a theater of political fight between the, the coalitions. And now you see big uh, guns coming in to, be, to, to go for chair of the seat of the uh, election chair. Yes, it is more about, it should be revived, it should work. But incompetence is one of the grounds on which the commission, the commissioners, can be removed. The second ground specifically mentioned there is chapter 6. And again, I surmise that it will not be too difficult to, to get together evidence to support both the grounds. So that choice has got to be made by you and your fellow commissioners. But with the court coalition warming up for yet another storm at the IEBC offices on Monday, the standoff continued between the Jubilee Coalition and the court brigade over the legality and necessity of the opposition coalition's protests, which are now entering their third week. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Na police are just trained for a very, very long time. <laughs> My friend Mugijaribu, let us not discard the message because we do not like the messenger. I think the IBC problem is that they are discarding the message because they don't like the messenger. If the messenger is caught, the message will not be heard. If it is somebody else, it may be heard. But aside from the running battles expected on the streets, the IEBC commissioners are also looking at a date with Parliament's Justice and Legal Affairs Committee, which is probing graft allegations relating to the procurement of electoral material in 2013. The allegations were raised in a damning report of the Public Accounts Committee. Members of Parliament have declined to approve IEBC's 45 billion shillings budget until the commissioners appear before the committee. Autaki kwenda kotini, autaki kwenda bunge, sasa inanakala tumengia mambo ya ya fujo sasa. Sisi kama wa Kenya, hatuko tayari kuendelea na IEBC tukijua ya kwamba yale matatizo ambao tumepata kutokana na kura Ya elfumbidi na kumina tatu. Kitaka kufunja IEBC, unapitia ile barabara ya Article 251. Muremi Mwangi, KTN News, Nairobi. Meanwhile, focus now shifts to the management of the protests by the law and forces, right from crowd control to the use of tear gas and even weapons. And as Chris Thiru reports, it is emerging that the tear gas used by the police was banned in 1993. Given that core leaders and their supporters are determined to continue holding demonstrations at adversary towers until IEBC commissioners feel the pressure and leave office, focus shifts on how the police are controlling the demonstrators who enjoy their picketing right as enshrined in the constitution. 
all the demonstrations, police have been forced to lobby tear gas canisters as well as water cannons to disperse the crowds. Now, according to security analyst Major Bashir Abdullahi, the police need extra lessons on how to handle crowds. We have not seen any rehearsal being conducted by the police in preparation for such control of crowds. It's important they do rehearsals to ensure that the crowd is dispersed peacefully before even they reach the kind of properties they protect. So it's unfortunate that the police will wait inside buildings for the crowd to really come all the way instead of halting them far. It has also emerged that the tear gas being used by the police was banned by the United Nations under the International Chemical Convention in 1993 due to its health implications. Surprisingly, the police themselves also fall prey to the tear gas since they are not fully equipped with gas masks. The convention says it is for international war or conflict. Now, that gives a bit of a leeway for use domestically. Because the, the, that, that convention says banned and used on international conflict. According to medical experts, the tear gas has short and long term effects that can lead to death. When someone is exposed to tear gas for a long time, the, in, uh, in the eye, the eye there is a the damage to the what you call the cornea of the eye. When there's a damage to the cornea of the eye, it gets a bit of scarring, and that leads to something we call cataracts, which just means the cornea is scarred. Police have also put to use the newly acquired water cannons used to spray the demonstrators with water, which is laced with acid and causes irritation on the skin. The government acquired 20 of them, with three being sent to Kisumu, three in Mombasa, and the rest in Nairobi County. If you're too close, the force will push you down, really. So the further you are away, as it spews out water, you can see the water actually having several uh, layers, because the distance is a bit far. The police are supposed to do their work uh, within the confines of the law. And as you, you are aware, in Article 238, uh, it states very clearly that uh, police are supposed to pursue uh, national security in, com in compliance uh, with the law and, 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 and human rights. However, on the contrary, police have been defending themselves, claiming that some of the demonstrators come armed with stones and other crude weapons, hence being forced to use force to repulse them. Well, according to CORD, not until the IBC commissioners give in to pressure, more demonstrations are expected ahead of the 2017 general election. <laughs> Chris Dairo, KTN News. Court leader Raila Odinga is dismissing claims that he is exploiting the murder of businessman Jacob Juma for his own political gain. Here's KT News' Rashid Ronald with that story from Diwa. ...of Dr. Michael Lamoro in Diwa constituency, where the court leader, while speaking in his native Dolu language, sought to dismiss those who claim that he's using the murder of controversial businessman Jacob Juma to gain political mileage. <laughs> The government has been asking whoever with information about Juma's death to report to the police. The blood of Juma is haunting you. You are the killer. <laughs> Deputy President William Ruto is among those who have accused Raila of seeking cheap publicity over the murder. That notwithstanding, the court leader termed the Jubilee government as a home that is waiting to crumble, saying court will take power come 2017. Hello. Lord. Lord. Power Lord. is taken. Lord. Power is taken. Lord. The IEBC issue also took center stage here with Raila saying the electoral body has no choice but to pack and go home. Rashid Ronald, KTN News, Ndiwa, in Homa Bay County. Nairobi is set for a major facelift as the county government embarks on an integrated urban development master plan. Groundbreaking ceremony for the project is due this month and will see the city divided into sub-center systems. A statement signed by Nairobi Governor Dr. Evans Kidero details how Runda, Ruaka, Ruiru, Ruai, Karen and Langata will be transformed into pure residential areas. The statement adds that city offices and commercial buildings will extend eastwards to Udhiru and Kabete. 
On the other hand, Donholm and Northern Airport Road areas will become the industrial and commercial sites for the capital city. Ruaraka and Kasarani will also become part of the city's residential and entertainment spots. Consequently, a railway line will be enhanced to link the sub-center systems. The master plan will also see the redevelopment of old housing units in seven quick projects. In the plan, 10,000 to 12,000 affordable housing units will be constructed. Now, the national and county governments are yet to agree on the classification of roads in the country. This comes as governors accuse the national government of illegally transferring the management of certain county roads to the national level. The governors claim this was intended to maintain control of the funds meant for devolved roads. However, the Ministry of Roads and Public Works insists that the reclassification was legal and a pending roads bill will help to address these challenges. The constitution stipulates that county governments are in charge of county roads, street lighting, traffic and parking, public road transport, as well as ferries and harbors, excluding international and national shipping. However, the conflict between the national and county governments over the control of roads that initially fell under the Kenya Rural Roads Authority, KERA, and the Kenya Urban Roads Authority, Kura, persists. On the 9th of August uh, 2013, uh, Transition Authority, uh, through Gazette Notice Number 137, uh, transferred roads, uh, the roads that are supposed to go to, to go to the counties, except the roads that are being managed by Kenya Rural Roads Authority, uh, Kenya Urban Roads Authority, uh, but of course, when you look at that, that goes against the, the constitution because the constitution only sees two types of roads, and national roads and uh, county roads. There is no room for Kera, there is no room for Kura as far as the, the constitution is concerned. Consequently, 39 out of 47 counties sought the intervention of the Senate. And the Senate in its report uh, also agreed with the governors that all the roads, all the county roads uh, should be transferred to be managed by the counties. However, uh, even that did not happen. So we actually went to, to the High Court, yeah, uh, and again uh, the High Court upheld our view. Then we saw the national government having reclassified the roads because what was supposed to be transferred to the counties is class D, E, F and the classified roads, whereas class A, B and C uh, is supposed to remain uh, with the national government. But through the reclassification, uh, which again was done unilaterally by the national government, we saw some of the roads that were in Class D uh, being, uh, let me say, promoted yeah, to Class C and higher, uh, which means again that they were moving uh, from being under the ambit uh, of uh, county, county, county government uh, back to the national, uh, nat national government. However, the principal secretary in charge of infrastructure looks at it differently. National roads are like class A, B and C, which again, if you sum up all those, is 40,000 kilometers. And this is mainly where we have high traffic, uh, volume, where it carries high traffic of volumes. So we are talking class A, class B and C. All these are um, inter-counties, which are connecting various inter-counties. And then apart from that, also we look at where there is high traffic. But again, this is, these roads continue to be reviewed every now and then to make sure that they meet the functionality which they are intended to. He knows that's not the correct uh, position in law. Once classification is done, the roads are identified, they are marked. If uh, um, the roads are to be revisited, it has to be in conformity with the constitution. Right now, county roads remain county roads, the national roads remain national roads. Within our proposed bill, uh, that is Ross Bill, which is now undergoing uh, discussion in Parliament, as soon as this is approved, we expect to have two authorities. One which is looking at uh, national highways, and then now we have Class C, which we have discussed now. That will be more or less the rural part, which is more or less the one linking the inter-counties. And then all the county roads now, D and E now, will fall under county, which again is free. That is, counties can form their own rural authorities in their respective counties to look at those roads. The real battle is about the funds controlled by the authorities, with the governors insisting that there is an overlap of functions. When you talk about transferring a function, uh, you don't just move a function alone. Uh, you move the function with the funds associated with it. 
So in other words, the funds that uh, originally were being assigned uh, to Kera and Kura, all those funds are supposed to, to come to the county government so, uh, so that we can, we can, we can manage, we can, uh, we can maintain uh, the roads that have been transferred with it. The national government through the Ministry of Roads and Public Works needs to sit down uh, with the 47 governors. They agree, they go back to the classification that had been agreed upon before uh, the intervention by the, uh, by, by the ministry to change the classification. This had been agreed upon way back in 2014. That classification should be respected. It should, the gazettement that was undertaken early this year should be revoked and the new gazettement undertaken by the ministry uh, respecting the respective roles of the two uh, levels of government. Of course, for more on that and such stories, please do tune in every Sunday at 8.30 for the Chamwada Report right here on KTN News, where you get the whole story. Let's move on to other news of the day. Former President Daniel Arab Moy has lauded the important role played by women in the development of churches in Kenya. The former president said this goes a long way in the spiritual nourishment of Christians. Moy was speaking today during the third day of the AIC Church Prayer Conference held in Kasarani, Nairobi. He said Christians should always preach peace. The prayers were led by the head of the AIC church, Silas Siego. <laughs> Siku hii ni siku ya kumbukumbu katika kalenda ya AIC. Kwa sababu ndoto yako imetimika. So nataka kushukuru ya kwamba we mwenyewe umekuja kuifungua siku hii ya leo. Nina furaha leo kufunguni kufungua mahali ambako Nyingi mutakuwa mkifanya kazi na kuenda kurudi nyumbani mahali ambapo hamja kuwa na mawazo yoyote hapo mbeleni. Lakini mwenye kuwasa na kuwa na mambo haya na kusukuma na kuna mama. Kama wanaume wangeseme wange ungana na kama vile mama walikuwa na moto mambo ya nyumba ingekwisha na mungekwisha mungejenga nyumba mbili kama hii all right, now, tonight the county government of Nairobi has announced the start of demolition of pure, poorly constructed buildings within the city, and that forms the basis of our number tonight. So take a look at this number, because uh, this is what we've gotten from the reports that were, uh, you know, done by the county government just uh, about last year. This is the number to focus on this week, 204. This is the number of unsafe residential buildings in Nairobi that will have to be destroyed. The demolition commences on Tuesday, that is the 17th of this month. That's just two days from now. And this is according to a statement from the county executive in charge of lands, Christopher Hayemba. So let's break down this number. Where are these buildings? Uh, how many of them in which areas? So let's start off with, um, of course, ground zero after the collapse of that building just over two weeks ago. 58 of the number number of buildings that will be demolished in Huruma. And then let's take a look at uh, not only Huruma, there's other areas. Zimmerman is one of them. And there the number is a little less, 28 number of houses and buildings to be demolished there. And then when we move on to South B, that is in Hazina Estate. Um, those are the number of houses, 19 to be demolished. And apparently these 19 houses belong to the National Social Security Fund. So that is something also to look out for. Many questions coming out of that. Did they get the right approvals? How did such a big organization like the NSSF construct buildings that were unsafe and unfit for human habitation? There will also be demolition in other areas. That is Umoja along Thicker Road as well as Dagoreti. This is set to begin on Tuesday. These are the numbers to look out for this week here on the number.
right, so today is the day. We have 449 days to the 2017 general election. It is the 15th day of May 2017. Remember, August 7, 2017, uh, in August is when we will be going to the next general election to vote across the board for president, member of National Assembly, member of Senate, county assembly, county women reps, as well as the members of county assembly. 449 days to go. Now, politicians are preparing themselves. There's all the political rhetoric in the country, but the all-important question is, have you registered as a voter? Well, this is something you may or may not know because uh, the IBC has been complaining of low voter turnout. The registration process as anchored in law is now continuous and this happens on a daily basis. Other than that, of course, we had the mass voter registration exercise that took place in February. But we're made to understand that this is a continuous process. And where is it taking place? It is taking place at the constituency level. That is all 290 constituency offices. That is where it is being done. Of course, the IEBC has over 24,000 registration centers in all those 290 constituencies that will be the polling centers in 2017. But the registration exercise is happening at the 290 constituencies. And it's not only there now, but that members of the diaspora will be able to vote and their registration will begin in March 2017. That is next year. So we just want to give you this timeline so that you start to prepare yourselves. Now, the voter registration exercise, which as we've said is continuous, will be suspended in May of 2017. This should then give way to the certification process, which will take place in June later of next year. That is between the 19th of June and the 26th of June, according to the timetable that has been released by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. So why are we telling all of this? One, of course, is to remind you that lest you forget, the voter registration exercise is continuous. But we're going to go a step further. This is what we want you to do here on Checkpoint and we'll continue to remind you across our social media platforms all week. We want to hear of your experiences as you go out to get yourself registered. Remember, this is only for those who were not registered in 2013 and didn't participate then. So give us your experiences. Go to your polling center, go to your constituency office. Let us know what that experience is like. This is our WhatsApp number right here on KTN News, 706 727272. Take a picture of yourself while at the constituency office trying to get yourself registered. Tell us what that experience was like. Did you find IEBC officials? Was the process quick? Was it not? Additionally, many have complained of not having their IDs to be able to participate in the voter registration exercise. So we also ask you, do you have a waiting card? Have you been waiting one month, seven months, two years, three years for your ID card? Send us that to this number right here. And we will be sharing this every Sunday night on Lest We Forget. We want to know what your experience is like. Is this all a myth? Is it? Um, or do the IEBC officials actually exist at the constituency offices? And is the process carrying on? And the reason we're saying this is because while all the politicians are preparing themselves, while the IEBC is preparing themselves, are you ready? Are you registered as a voter? Let us know. 706 727 Send us a picture, take a video, a short one, and we will share that right here on Checkpoint. So lest we forget, the voter registration exercise is continuous, and we're looking forward to your feedback right here on Checkpoint. The General Service Unit and Kenya Prisons Women teams won the 10th Amaco Insurance Volleyball Tournament that came to a close in Eldoret. GSU from behind five scores in the first set to lead the paramilitary side who stagnated at seven points before they had a renewed determination for the scores to tie at 24. In the men's third place a playoff, Nairobi Water ran over KPA 3-1 in a thrilling match. Kenya Pipeline women's team lost the title to prisons in the finals. Prisons secured three sets to one to clinch the title.
Oversight Committee in the National Assembly is proposing barring senators from running for the gubernatorial seats in 2017, citing a conflict of interest. And so we had run a Twitter poll earlier this evening asking you, should senators be barred from running for governor in 2017? The poll results are in. 66% of you say no. And 34% of you say yes. I just want you to take a look at our Super Bowl tonight for some of your feedback on this issue. Sky T. Karyuki says, barring senators from running for governor is against democracy practices. Let the voters decide. I think we have another one uh, if we can find that on our Super Bowl. If not, uh, let's uh, take a look at that. Yes, from Collins Kiplimo says, no, that is denying them their constitutional right of vying for any seat. They are taking us to the olden days. Here's another one from Jackson Tumbo. Uh, says, why are most senators running for governor seats in 2017? Because corruption was devolved. And finally, Dickens and Yamogo, in response to the statements made by um, a member of National Assembly who was on tonight, Joe Mutambo, he says, too bad that six years down the line, a whole legislator can't see or feel the fruits of the new constitution. Those are your views tonight, and we thank you for participating, as always, in our Twitter poll. Please continue this conversation online. As always, the hashtag is Checkpoint. Now, finally, I want to go to my take tonight. Over the last few days, a rather bizarre conversation has been going on in the corridors of Parliament. Part of it is what we have been discussing on Checkpoint tonight. The recommendation by a committee of the National Assembly that the current senators should be barred from running for gubernatorial seats next year. That this has angered the current senators is understandable. After all, every politician dreams of being re-elected in perpetuity. But the issue at hand is a lot more than just the feeling of a few senators or the never-ending supremacy battles between the two houses of parliament. Article 38 of the Constitution provides, and I quote, that every adult citizen has the right, without unreasonable restrictions, to be a candidate for public office. This means that, short of a criminal issue, there are few other things that should stop any Kenyan from seeking whatever public office they choose to run for. The irony of this recommendation is that it came from a parliamentary committee whose core mandate is to ensure the 2010 constitution is implemented to the letter. The committee argues that the current senators are too engrossed in trying to become governors that they may not be objective in their oversight role in counties. This might sound like a reasonable proposition, but the hypocrisy in it is difficult to miss. This is because part of the MP's job is to check the excesses of the executive, that includes the president. Should we then have laws to stop them from running for president following the same logic? What about MCAs who want to run for the governor's seat? Do they also face a conflict of interest? Granted, the Senate has not been the best watchdog over county resources, but many analysts point out that it is some members of the very National Assembly who fought so hard to ensure a weak and almost ineffective Senate. One would have hoped that the National Assembly would, instead of chasing shadows, focusing on real issues. They have only recently failed to pass the two-thirds gender bill, which is a constitutional requirement. They have failed to give life to Chapter 6 of the Constitution that would ensure only leaders with integrity are elected. If they truly want some to bar someone from running for public office, then let it be the thieves who use public office to enrich themselves. And that is my take tonight. Thank you for watching the show. Our sign language interpreter has been William Silla. My name is Yvonne Okwara Matole. Wishing you a great week ahead. Good night.